Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. Today's program, part of the BBC's Freedom Season. We live in the internet age, but maybe most of us haven't realized just how radically it's going to change our lives. My guest today is at the leading edge of an anarchist movement which wants to use the so-called dark web, anonymous, borderless and lawless, to empower individuals and undermine big government. Cody Wilson's symbolic first move was to make a gun using open source software and a 3D printer. Is this really where we want the internet to take us? Cody Wilson, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks for having me. I've seen you described as a crypto anarchist. Is that a description you would place upon yourself? Yeah, uh, enthusiastically, sometimes too. So, yeah. What does it mean? Um, we invoke an essay by Timothy May, and this was called the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. So it comes from a cypherpunk tradition. Um, the idea was public key encryption and growing bandwidth of the internet and these new network technologies and peer-to-peer -peer technologies specifically. Uh, would kind of shut out government intervention. Why the gun? You know, why did you make such a point of garnering worldwide publicity by showing how yeah. to download a design for a gun and make it homemade yeah. with the use of a 3D printer? I re I, in the beginning, we had the ambition, maybe, uh, for this kind of garnering this worldwide attention about, but we didn't know. It was a process that also kind of led us into, um, it's very difficult to, to describe. There was a kind of logic that, that we started accessing once we got involved in this and once we had kind of received a few waves of attention. Um, and then we realized, like, the, um, I don't know, there was a strategy that we could execute and that in the end, like, to, to kind of get the government to step into the situation would be the way that we could actually succeed. It was, it's very difficult to understand. So it was a provocation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, of course it was intended as a provocation, but like that it had these grander elements to it and which are now kind of very difficult to succinctly describe. Well, it's um, not so difficult for me to look back at some of the things you said and just wonder just how irresponsible you <laughs> could want to be. I mean, everyone you proclaim should have access to a gun. I want the widest distribution possible of implements of violence. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I intentionally use language like that and worse, if you can put it on that spectrum. Well, let's stick with that. I mean, what on earth is the public good of wanting the widest distribution possible of implements of violence? So I don't define it in terms of the public good, right? In fact, my, I guess the very lead of our, of our project is questioning this, this idea of a kind of consensual universal claim to a public good, um, that there's a certain kind of moralistic, uh, you know, hegemony of a human rights pacifistic kind of paradigm, which is kind of foisted upon us. It's used to kind of like, um, reinforce a certain structure of domination, right? But also, because this is an American project, and we began really directly appealing to like an American liberal kind of constitutional nostalgia, um, I was using Tench Cox and some of these other like great uh, insurrectionists in American history, uh, and I was directly hearkening back to some of those statements that they made. All right, well, all very philosophical, but let's just think practical. What you did was put up on the web a design for a gun which for just a few days before the federal authorities made you take it down was available to anyone. I believe at least a hundred thousand people downloaded it. Yeah. So there are now many many people not just in the US but theoretically across the world who can follow your guide and build a homemade gun using a 3D printer. Yeah that's right and of course it, we didn't just put it up for a few days right to put it up for a few days is to put it up forever. And That's right. everyone kind of understands, you know, the dimension of, of that act. And so what we did was um, a kind of permanent situational transfer um, in the direct, I guess, the direct contradiction of, of an entire, yeah, I don't know, like um, and the, the whole situation was trying to say, like, this is something that shouldn't happen. And we were saying, no, it's, it's going to. And sure. And, and, you know, you've explained that there's a philosophy behind it, but it's sticking with the practical. You live in a country where there are 300 million guns in civilian hands, a country where, frankly, anybody who wants a gun can get a gun. Yes, there are certain restrictions, but we know through online purchase and Craigslist and everything else, if you really want a gun, you can get a gun. Yeah. So what on earth was the point? Yeah, in fact, it was less discernible to an American audience in the beginning. Uh, there was a kind of ennui about it. I was like, hey, look, we're going to put this, you know, we wanted to to communicate to people just how radical we thought this idea was. We're going to put it online, anyone can have a gun. Uh, and the typical American response for the first few months was, so what? You know, I, I can go buy one. 
Um, so it was a challenge. I mean, you, you pushed it to the most perverse limit because you decided with your company that you've set up, as mm. I understand it, to produce a particular part for a lethal semi-automatic rifle, the part which in an ordinarily produced manufactured gun has the serial number on it. And you're right, offering right. people the chance to buy that part right produced by a 3D printer, right. of course, with no serial number on it. It's an invitation to criminals. Oh, to buy? No, Sorry. no, th there was no economic element. No, I'm not suggesting so. it. No, I'm just saying it's an invitation to criminals to make a weapon with your particular part that you're offering open source to anybody, making that gun untraceable. Uh, yeah, but you're, you're familiar with the Liberator pistol, right? Like, no, but I'm not talking about the Liberator now. I'm talking about oh, the AR-15 yeah, no, no, this, this was like a, This was like our entry into the space. Yeah, but I, I don't consider that to be as radical as, as the pistol, but of course... No, the, but it's a much more lethal weapon. It's in fact no the, question. the sort of weapon that Adam yeah. Lanza used in Sandy Hook Elementary School Oh, it School had its moment of infamy. 20 children and 6 adults. Exactly, and after Sandy Hook, people started paying attention to what we And why do you want to help people develop a gun like that that is untraceable because the key part that has the serial number is off a 3D printer. I, I love where you're coming with the question, but we hadn't actually contributed anything to that space at that point. Um, making, making rifle receivers for AR-15s was kind of commonplace, and the files were already on the internet. I mean, we didn't really, we kind of brought people's attention to the fact that that could be done, but we didn't really, in a meaningful way, contribute to that moment. I think we, we, we made usable AR-15 receivers in polymer, which was, again, kind of new. But that was just like the opening act to get people to pay attention to what we were trying to do, which was this pistol concept. I, again, I, I think maybe, I'm not trying to just kind of avoid the question. I'm saying that was already like achievable. The, the, really, the only thing that we did with that moment was tell people, oh, look, this is actually pretty easy. Yeah, There's I, a subjective element to your own, to, to the genesis of I power I suppose what space, I'm asking yeah. you to address is a, is, is a sort of moral reflection yeah. on your activities. And you're suggesting to me, this has nothing to do with morality. I'm just pointing out well, to people what they can do and giving them the ability to do it. Let's go, because this is why I do BBC, right? This is why I do UK television, European television, because it always comes down to, uh, back to, well, what's, what's the level of responsibility? Or what's the moral question here? And, and I really think I want to look or I want to try to go beyond good and evil here. I, I really think that the greater question is, is, is this morality to set up a kind of uh, permanent, uh, you know, surveillance warfare state program that is, is only like, that only gives us a kind of appeal to universalism that reinforces it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whether it be guns or drugs or a host of other things, medicine, whatever, the government sees fit to regulate in the interest, they say, of the public. And it seems to me your message, and let's not get stuck on guns, but your message generally is that you don't believe in any form of government regulation. And if you can use the internet to subvert yeah. regulation, rules and control yeah. coming from the state, you will. Yeah, I think so. Now, there, I think there are certain projects I won't, I won't step into. One, because they're less technically achievable. Like with the 3D printer, we noticed that like, oh, you know what, these plastics, which are kind of already beginning to be diffused and distributed among people, these printers can already print the gun. So it was a moment that was just sitting on the table waiting to be kind of executed. Those don't come around very often. Um, but yes, I, and it's not about, it's about being extremely suspicious of the kind of self-justifications of, of the present order. I mean, it's not just like, oh, I oppose regulation because it's a kind of fetishistic, you know, reaction that I have. Oh, all regulate. I mean, all of that, that lives within all of us, right? Like, well, I don't want to be controlled. I, I really think it's kind of something else that we can teach and project a kind of suspicion and then demonstrate it with these objective, like, strategies and, and projects we have. And this, this yields a certain, wh what was the provocation that the government responded to in my case? A kind of direct message, which was like, oh, yeah, gun control, that's nice and everything, but look, you can just press a button and get a gun. That was something that had to be contested. I just want to put to you this thing about the Silk Road. Now, yeah. the Silk Road became a marketplace mm -hmm. for the sorts of internet trades which were, in the real world, or the legitimate world, illegal. Yeah. It, it may have been gun running, it may have been buying drugs. All of these things happened on the Silk Road. You were a great advocate of the Silk Road. I, explain uh, explain to me I, why. And I, I wish I was a better one. And so I want to kind of loop this back to your question to me about like, well, I don't care about evil. No, I, I want to come from a different ethical discourse. I want us to be able to think evil. I want us to be able to engage in extreme phenomena. I believe that this is the kind of <laughs> human destiny <laughs> right now. And that, and that there's a massive cultural social force, which has been kind of ingrained and, and is something of a legacy power, which is built on preventing us from reaching um, these conclusions and these operations. 
I wonder if you got a buzz, you know, building on what we've discussed, whether you got a buzz from recently being named in Wired magazine as one of the 15 most dangerous people in the world. Is, is that something that actually appeals to your character? That's the thing. I, th I think Robert Beckers and the guy who, who named me that thought it would be some kind of injury. But yeah, like, you know, yeah, I was just no, like, I'm saying was like, you've yeah, got a kick out of it. It was that. something of a feather in my, in my cap, I told people. Uh, anarchy, and we started with that word, anarchy is such an interesting concept because it, it it seems to build into itself so much destructive power, to, to tear things down, to destroy, to be nihilistic. I just wonder, is it your aim, your ambition, to tear down the capitalist system? Okay, wow. So w capitalism is such, like anarchy, is a word packed with all this historical meanings and associations and everyone's kind of fighting over it. I've often used the word anarchy and crypto anarchy as a way of you know, challenging and persuasively redefining that historical position. Um, but mostly, I, I want people to think anti-state, to be extremely suspicious well, of the state. I know. So far, we've talked right? about state regulation, yeah, how yeah. It, it's, for you, unacceptable to regulate guns or maybe and drugs or anything I'm not or trying or to be else. precious about the but, word. But no, I I'm want just, to turn you know, to capitalism. Yeah. It seems to me there is an interesting debate about 3D printing in particular, yeah, yeah, yeah. which, because it changes the, the, the mode of production, yeah. it does challenge our traditional economies, which, you know, in the developed world have been built for centuries on production, manufacturing, and now if you can take a product, you can look at it, you can load it into your computer, turn it into a design, which you can then download for yourself and make at home yeah. on your printer, that just kills <laughs> off intellectual property rights in the manufacturing industry. It, it would seem to, uh, yeah, make them less operable, right? So um, a number of people writing on the left and the post-left are extremely happy about digital manufacture, right? Not just 3D printing, but all forms of digital mm. manufacture. These network devices, this disintermediation of the traditional institutional and, and, and industrial structures. Uh, and no question, like that model is antithetical to the current kind of top-down, progressively administered large corporation. And, and this, of course, this model can be easily ported to the gun control debate, which is, again, one of the first things we did. We said, oh, gun control, background checks, that's fine. What does that depend upon? A large corporation stamping a metal rifle receiver that you can go buy at a company, which all along the points of you know, the road is kind of written to the tablatures of power. Well, now I have something where you can download something uh, from the internet relatively anonymously, print out in the relative anonymity of your own home, and what's more, a historical bonus, undetectable to modern imaging techniques. I mean, it was like, you know, the yeah. explosion of the whole paradigm, a changing of the coordinates of what was even thought achievable. So what I'm suggesting is the media is focused mostly on your anti-state message, but I'm suggesting you have that an anti-corporate, anti anti-capitalist message. But is it your idea that you can, over time, imagine the internet and the use of the internet tearing down yes. capitalism? Yes, I, the only thing that has stopped me so far, I mean, literally stopped me from doing what I was doing, publishing the files to the internet, was a kind of IP claim, an intellectual property claim, uh, by the political diplomatic uh, bureau of the State Department. Um, it's these regimes of intellectual property which prevent biotech, electronics, armament, um, things in education, from, from getting out of certain structures and, and into the people in a more diffused kind of way. Um, and let's, well, use, let's use a 3D printer as a concrete example. I mean, this thing was sold and used uh, by a lot of these legacy players, Stratasys, 3D Systems, people who've been in the space for 30 years, once they saw that there was a retail space for it, they started giving you commercials on TV about, oh, it's the next industrial revolution. Look at the ways you can articulate your own individuality, and oh, look at the little trinkets you can make. But there was an extremely intense effort at preventing unintended uses, as Avi Reichenthal said. I mean, the actual interesting kind of uses, which, you know, when the 3D printer can begin to print the 3D printer, like, how can we containerize each different component of this machine? So to give you Stratus as an example, um, they containerize, like Apple, um, the material that you buy. You know, you can't, you can't hack the, the firmware or hardware on the machine. I mean, everything is segmented and prevented and phones home. It's a kind of illusion of an industrial revolution, which in the end, we say, was just advertising. But if it's just an illusion and you want to go much further, I've just got a basic question, which is why will, in the future, your future, why will anybody invest in invention, in R&D, if <laughs> as soon as they produce something new, yeah. it simply goes to open source internet availability uh, and anybody can make it yeah. for themselves? Th this is a, a common progressive refrain, you know, like, well, the large firm is valuable because well, it invests in just give me some simple answers. Well, this is Schumpeter. He says, uh, it, only the large firm can innovate. That's not true. We all know that like small people with nothing to lose can innovate, which almost like with their kind of aesthetic, you know, extremism, devote themselves to an idea or a project. And mostly like portfolio patents uh, or patents and portfolios and these, these large programs of IP just allow these large players to sue you once you try to enter the space and, and bring someone down. 
I would say, uh, to the contrary, if, if the walls of IP crumbled a, a bit more, there would be more rapid innovation in different spaces. Now, this seems like some kind of like, that I'm like some liberal romantic and like, oh, let the, you know, let innovation reign free. I just believe that that's structurally more true. You have a great trust, it seems, in, in where the internet can take us. You're, you're basically a very optimistic guy about how individuals can be empowered through the internet. Are there not some very recent reasons that give you pause? I mean, I'm thinking of Bitcoin, for example. Yeah. Been trumpeted for the last couple of years as the future of currency. It's pure electronic currency. It's not controlled by a nation state or a reserve bank. It is based on algorithms. It's computerized. It was devised by some brilliant genius in Japan. And yet, it yeah. turns out over the last few weeks that the greatest store exchange for Bitcoin has yeah. been hacked into and they've lost millions and millions of dollars of bitcoins that's right, that's right. and faith and credibility in this currency half, has half gone through the floor well i don't one i don't i don't believe that that's true the, there's still strong price support for the uh, for bitcoin right well now. it's more than halved in value doesn't it yeah so if I you mean, bought at the top you're now thinking i wish i'd never heard of Bitcoin. never buy at the top right but i mean you don't know where the top <laughs> is my point is that you know you have a dollar in your pocket yeah. you're pretty sure that the u.s government isn't going to go bust that dollar means something. Oh, no. Bitcoin does not have that fundamental guarantee. If th so this comes to a critical decision about what is money. You know, Is it a social contract backed by a large player or something? And, and Peter Thiel once told me, you know, the dollar will have value because of guns and oil. That's probably true in like a very practical, immediate, short-term sense. But look, everyone knows that the dollar is in a, a kind of perpetual free fall. And we have these like expansions of these credit facilities and QE and open market operations. I mean, it's just an instrument to achieve a wealth effect, a domestic policy to get the people happy about, about the stock market and their jobs and everything. It's an instrument used to kind of beat us over the head. I mean, Bitcoin as a store of value is still extremely valuable. In, in the last year alone, right, it did like 56 times uh, in appreciation. Now, I don't want to sell Bitcoin as a way that people can get rich or speculate or something, but digital libertarians are still long Bitcoin. I'm still, I mean, my company, Defense Distributed, is in Bitcoin. We're working on a, an anonymity protocol, a, a tool in the browser uh, called the Dark Wallet. Uh, we've, we've been working on it since like to November. Make, to make exchanges yeah, using Bitcoin yeah. even more secretive yes, exactly, than before. Exactly. And you know darn well who is going to want to use that new technology that yes, you're uh, the, the Money the laundry, free man. criminals. Yeah. The, the free man would want to use it, I the think. The free man? Yeah, I think so. The criminal is the ultimate free man. Well, let's say something. Most human activity, and this is an OECD uh, assertion, right? Most human activity in commerce happens outside of these tablatures of regulation, you know, the, the all-seeing eye of the state, and will continue to, to the point where, like, two-thirds of all human activity by 2020 will be, like, the black market activity. That's, like, the, what just has to get done, what has to happen in this world. Now, I want these people to be able to use digital cash. I want them to be able to use it anonymously and, and, or as anonymously as possible. And everything else is just a kind of an illusion. Uh, everyone is, is trying to tell a competing story about the history of technology, their place as subjects to power. Everyone's trying to brush up Bitcoin, put a suit and tie on it and say like, oh no, it's part of the story of the history of money and of nation states. Well, we're saying no, it represents the fundamental question mark. Will criminals use it? Yes, of course, they use cash too. The thing is, Bitcoin will never be regulated. When there is a crisis, like there was in the Mt. Gox exchange, when it became clear it had been penetrated, hacked into, there was no way to restore confidence, credibility amongst Bitcoin users, because there is no real authority behind well, that currency. I've got two things to say about this. I mean, one, thank God that the banks didn't step in or the government step in to say, no, we should, you know, make everyone whole in this exchange and stuff. I mean, it was bad technology. It was a bad CEO, a bad company. It should have been destroyed and liquidated. None of the people I know were in Gox. Uh, a lot of the people I know were laughing at the people who got owned in Gox. Now, that's not necessarily fair, but we use other exchanges. Uh, we keep most of the Bitcoin that we have with ourselves. You know, don't trust someone with your private keys. That happens. Everything you uh, say and point to suggests a fundamentally different world within, what, 10, 20 years. You say the black market, what we call the black market, the sort of shadow economy is going to explode. I think it's, it's already like the largest, if, if we took the entire world global shadow economy, it's the largest economy in the world. I mean, it's bigger than the United States. Uh, necessarily so, right? Especially as the, the regulatory state becomes so Byzantine. I mean, it's impossible to even get anything done. People have to eat. 
You know, people have to like live in the world. And as I listen to your visionary stuff, I can't help looking at <laughs> comments from Yevgeny Morozov, one of the leading yeah. sort of analysts of the internet and how it's impacting the world, who talks about two clear phenomena amongst people like yourself who spend all of your time thinking about an internet future. He talks about cyber utopianism and internet centrism. The idea that some, ident uh, as he puts it, unidentified logic of the internet will reshape every environment it penetrates. He says so often it's actually going to be the other way around. I think actually I'm, I'm more suspicious of the, the future that everyone's talking about. But I, I reverse this a lot. I say like, no, the, the, the utopia, the real utopia, is right now, is thinking that like there could be some kind of, you know, these uh, secular assertions about like the state of technology. Like, no, after I do the 3D printing thing, uh, these New York congressmen come out and say like, no, we're going to freeze the state of gun technology to where critical pieces of guns will always be made of metal. You know, or like, uh, we're going to return to 1994, we're going to do background checks and everyone's going to have a serial number on their gun. I mean, the entire organization and in, in framing of the situation suggests the opposite. The utopia is now. But do you not see, I guess what Morozov is pointing to is that you may be overestimating the ability of individuals to harness the power of the internet. It actually may be traditional power structures, so the I, state and big corporate right, right, capitalist right. enterprises who are best able to harness the power. No question. What, what did Edward Snowden teach all of us well, if we I'm had not already learned Snowden. it? Yeah, I mean that the deep state is real and that like there is no way to like separate the eminence of like the, the mechanisms of control from what would ostensibly be the, the techniques of liberation. I mean, you, you, you suggest we're, we are going to be freer than ever thanks to the internet. I might suggest did that I, we may be that? more exposed, more vulnerable, and more uh, party to the powers that be than ever before. I believe that the current technologies, Facebook, Bitcoin, uh, Google Glass, these things are actually more successfully used as technologies of the self, ways that we can articulate ourselves, bind ourselves to an already existing power than anything else. I'm not optimistic about like the grand liberative moment. I, I think emancipatory political phenomena are possible. Look at what I did with the gun. You know, that this, fo this followed a kind of fatal uh, uh, objective strategy, which was like, I don't know, uh, we put the gun everywhere it needed to go. It's in the internet forever. But that doesn't mean that there's going to be some kind of a uh, mass human awakening or grand, you know, enlightenment because of it. I think that these techniques and these strategies are still possible against this large incredible adversary, you know, Family America or the you know, UK, uh, the West itself. It can be kind of tricked uh, into, into helping us execute our plans, but I, I never think that uh, there will be some mass awakening. And a final thought. You seem to believe the Internet is the great way to diminish, maybe even destroy, big government. Barack Obama addressing this point not so long ago, he said, hang on a minute, remember what big government is. We." our big government. Government is us. And you simply do not buy that for one second? Uh, Barack Obama is a grocery clerk, a fraud, and a salesman just used to sell you something on TV. All right. So democracy, as it's practiced in the United States or the UK... Democracy has been liquidated. The West has locked its cannon. Everything else is just a pretense to sell you like the larger mechanisms of control that you're not aware of. I mean, liberalism is like the, the, the thing we whistle while we like assert our domination over people. So no, that's all just like, that's all for TV. Uh, I guess just like this interview. Cody Wilson for TV. Thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thanks so much. Thank you very much indeed.